Hey, pals, you know what you should do? You should come hang out with us on Twitter. Give us a follow at twitter.com slash go with the heat. And while you're there, tweet at us what Tubbs impression you want John to do. Once you put it on there, he can't say no. But let's quit chumping and get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 20, titled By Hooker by Crook. These episode names just keep getting better. I'll say that. Like, <laughs> hey, I, this one's really <laughs> apt for this episode, right? <laughs> It originally premiered on March 20th, 1987. We have an all-star team that is writing and directing this episode. It is written by Dick Wolf, who wrote essentially every episode in this season. I'm sure his desk was piled high of scripts, and even if he's not credited as a writer, it's heavily edited by Dick Wolf before it made it out to the set. But it is directed by the Don Johnson, which is interesting as we talk more about this episode and the choices for filming (laughs) (laughs) he also directed the episode back in the world which is the first stones war episode and then he's got two more coming so fyi more dj directed episodes coming (laughs) coming your way (laughs) does that mean more dj girlfriends uh maybe (laughs) before we get started can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives guys in this episode because we were talking about that don johnson directs this episode me and melissa started talking about more about movies that don johnson has been in and there was this one that caught my attention that we watched the trailer for starring don johnson and mickey rourke titled harley davidson and the marlboro man now you have to Give me a pass here, Miami Vice folks. This is the first time we're going through this run of Miami Vice. It also means I have not seen many Don Johnson movies. And so this was a new one to me. Uh, For the record, I've seen it. Just want to (laughs) say. Of course you have. It's got Tom Sizemore, Mickey Rourke, and Don Johnson in it. I know. What could be better? (laughs) So is Don... is. On the Marble Man in this situation, or is he? <laughs> He's Marble Man. I'm not. <laughs> and Mickey Rourke is he, Harley he Davidson. Is. Yeah, Mickey Rourke the, is the, Harley does Davidson. He even smoke? I don't know. I can't remember. Yes, yes. I'm pretty sure we see that in there. The trailer is fantastic because it's done as like a western, mm-hmm. but while everyone's riding motorcycles. Yes. <laughs> that was like about 1991. <laughs> What caught my attention in this movie, other than Don Johnson being a cowboy, which I will never pass up. I am seeing this movie <laughs> He's somehow. He's a hot cowboy, by the way. <laughs> is that the director's name is Simon Windsor. Now, Simon Windsor has directed a lot of movies. He's very successful. He also spent 11 years in film school, so it paid off. He, <laughs> he, he directed Harlequin, Daryl, which is a you know D period, A period, R period. It's a sci-fi robot movie. Ah. He, he also directed Free Willy, Operation Dumbo Drop, Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles. But I'm skipping one here, so I'm going to go back. Dumbo the... Drop? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I like that movie. Doesn't that have Bill Murray in it? This guy's yes, a legend. It okay. <laughs> I did skip one because the movie he did right before Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man is a family favorite. In, For your family. In, in my house. <laughs> Not <yes>. my family. <laughs> He also directed in 1990, Quigley Down Under. Oh, oh yeah. I got to hide that movie whenever I'm (laughs) looking for something on. God forbid our dad ever see it. (laughs) It's a perfect back-to-back Tom Selleck Western, Don Johnson as a cowboy. But isn't it... why? Okay, never mind. I don't. I don't know. I'm not going to ask any questions. Why would Tom Selleck be it, in Australia? Why would he be a cowboy in Australia? What? Why? It, it's why. It's just even why. worse than that. But we're just going to leave it where it is. Yeah, I think we should. Because I'm confused on that one. Also, Free Willy is not a good movie. I don't like that movie. It makes me sad. <laughs> I mean, I understand the whale gets on out of the end. Note, <laughs> on, on a side note, Tom Selleck much more believable cowboy than Don Johnson. Sorry, Don. Well. I, I do believe that. I mean, come on. No one could say I can't, can't say anything with that bad mustache. about. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. I can't say anything bad about Tom Selleck. <laughs> but I'm more of a three men and a baby kind of movie Tom Selleck than uh, I mean Ted Danson, Tom Selleck, Steve Gutenberg. How could you go wrong? Huh? <laughs> well, this is the opposite of a cowboy episode. <laughs> <laughs> Miami Vice. Although I would love to see a cowboy episode of Miami Vice. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we did see kind of one yes. with Willie Nelson. True, true. But no Don Johnson dressed like a cowboy. That's what we need. Well, let's go talk about this episode because let's get a little wacky. We got two professional wrestlers in it. So <laughs> <laughs> let's go talk about this episode. All right. So we open up and I'm thinking casino. Oh, no, wait. It's casino night on the yacht. Okay. Miami High Life, you are weird. <laughs> Do they ever get tired of all the parties? <laughs> the whole team is there. Croc is talking to Christine. We find out her, her name later is Christine. And although he is there as Burnett and Tub Sarah's Cooper, he is there as I'm ready to talk to a woman and move on from my junkie ex girlfriend, Sonny Crockett. And Cooper not so is there much to cock block the crap out of him. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's like, no, we have work to do. <laughs> Tabs comes running over and he's like, hey, the person we're supposed to be watching has left. We should probably go follow them. Sonny is telling Christine, Hey, I'll give you a call. She's like, I'm not listening. He's like, don't worry about that. Here you go. I, I got my ways. I'm a stalker. <laughs> I will steal evidence. I know people. <laughs> I wrote Daniel license plate. <laughs> <laughs> the duo will follow a man who's with a hooker back to a hotel. They are both extremely drunk. And the duo just kind of parked wait, 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 outside. Wait, wait, is, it, 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 is it clearly a hooker? Because I think we... We find out later that it wasn't so obvious that it was a hooker. <laughs> yeah, we were supposed to think she was a model. Oh, interesting. A model that was going... Model. Never mind. <laughs> a model that was yeah. with that really yeah, old it, man. It's another, it's another 10, 20 minutes into the episode before we find out she was a hooker. <laughs> the duo are just parked outside and they're like struggling to stay awake. I kind of take a nap. They're supposed to be watching this man, Symington. And the Crockett's complaining because everyone else is getting laid but him. <laughs> that was pretty much the gist of that. Everyone, we could be in bed right now, but instead we're over here waiting around for someone to move. And of course, they're going to miss all of the action because as soon as Symington gets to his room, the door opens. He gets pulled inside. Uh, Allie, the woman who's there with him, sees what's happening and runs away and gets chased by a man with rubber bands all over his face. <laughs> 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 and these two goons one chases after her isn't able to get to the elevator in time and then they take Symington and they throw him over the railing and the only time the only thing that the duo sees is just the sp splat of the body onto the ground <laughs> and see that si Symington says they don't see anything else even our two muscle bound goons are able to disappear yeah which is just amazing to me because you think all right guy falls uh, gets chucked over the balcony so so the duo sees splat they jump out the car aren't you gonna stop to very large sweaty men trying to uh, briskly waddle away like aren't those the two guys you're gonna stop and question <laughs> not only that but this is so they're doing surveillance and they're watching this guy they miss completely him get abducted and murdered so far we have goons one surveillance zero we're gonna keep score <laughs> so let's talk goons now for for the sake rather than call them goon one and goon two we're gonna call them ooga and booga <laughs> to make things easy <laughs> Uga is played by <laughs> Captain Lou Albano. He's rubber band man. <laughs> he was actually a wrestler back in the 60s and 70s and became a manager going into the 80s for the WWE, WWF stuff. And is actually, he did this thing with Cindy Lauper that they call the Rock Old Wrestling Connection. It was this real big deal on MTV at the time. It really helped spike the popularity of wrestling coming into the 80s. What's great is that Captain Lou also right. takes credit for Cindy Lauper's popularity. <laughs> yeah, because his yeah yes. his persona was yeah, a which, jerk basically. Mm -hmm. And Booga Goon Number Two is <laughs> Alpha Way, who was managed by the way at the time, managed by Captain Lou. Uh, he was a current WWE and WWF wrestler, a Samoan wrestler who was actually trained by Rocky Johnson. And Peter Mavia, who are the Dwayne the Rock Johnsons' dad and grandpa. That is a deep family heritage for the Johnsons, and they have more. Oh yeah, they're wrestling now. They have mm -hmm. the With Uso brothers, and the, who are their his cousins, and then uh, Roman, Roman Reigns. Reigns. 
It's his cousin. And on the, on the women's on the side. W- women's yeah, side. Nia Jax and they have another one. I can't remember her name. Mm-hmm. Tiana or something. Yeah, she, they, there was like sisters that are wrestling against each other. If it's not clear, this is a wrestling household. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Afa connected to that, or or Booga, Booga connected to that. He was I like also to call him Booga. <laughs> he, he was also in Mister Nanny. Uh, oh, Hulk Hogan. okay. When we come back from the opening credits, it just shows Allie and she's running away. She's packing up really fast, and then she's gonna run off out of out of her apartment. And that's all we see of that. So we're gonna get a lot more Allie, but this is just a setup that she's clearly afraid of. Not just of seeing someone get murdered, but that they're going to continue to try and murder her, which the Miami Vice don't seem too concerned about that. Yeah, no, they don't. <laughs> no, it, it, actually, the, the very next scene we get is based a funny Vice meeting in which we learn that the Vice Squad is a stump. <laughs> they don't know why this man magically fell out of the sky. <laughs> no witnesses. Castillo is also very disappointed. And Dad continues to be disappointed throughout the rest of the episode. Don't have high expectations. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it it's worse. In fact, at one point in my notes, I wrote, no one tell Dad. <laughs> before they leave the precinct, Crockett takes a moment before they're going to head out and go talk to the woman who threw this party to get more information. They stop and Sonny looks up christine's information because you know that's what police computers are used for that way you can look up information about girls you might want to date okay if you were a policeman (laughs) i for sure know that if you were a policeman and you were single you would be using that computer to look up women constantly and do not lie i'm pretty sure that's a fireable offense yeah and you'd still do it (laughs) so is the fact that he looks her up and doesn't find out anything that we learn at the end of the episode about her mean that he's a lazy cop or well i mean no one knows that right though that connection doesn't get made until later no one knows that at that point yeah but they they did they had to dig for a month they said they investigated her for a month to find that information so that's not known to the police yet no (laughs) (laughs) now pals if you've been watching miami vice or you you love Miami Vice. There is something that you know and that adds to a layer of this episode. It's directed by Don Johnson and that Don Johnson and Melanie Griffith, who plays Christine, have quite the past. Melanie Griffith, at the age of 14, started dating old Dirty Don. Um... <laughs> I think Sorry. we should refrain uh, from judging it. Should... <laughs> okay, I, I shouldn't be okay. I'm sorry. So while Don Johnson was doing a movie with Melly Griffith's mother, he started hitting on her 14 year old daughter. Yeah. <laughs> they start hanging out and start dating. And so we see her in this episode. That let, let, let's go through here. So she married Don Johnson in 1976. They divorced six months later, and then sometime around 1988, to check in the rehab and then rekindle with Don Johnson. They would get married again in 89, have a kid, and then get divorced in 96, but this time because of Don Johnston's substance abuse. So she would then go on to marry Antonio Banderas, and then... The same uh, year she divorced Don uh, Johnson, though. So that leads me to think that... Yeah, this, <laughs> The, the same year. Essentially, it was just rinse and repeat because she had the same substance abuse issues and uh, they got divorced, actually, or announced they were getting divorced in 2014. Melanie Griffith, Griffith by the way, her first major role in seven, 1975's Night Moves, in which she featured in some pretty uh, racy nude scenes at 17 years old. So, Damn. So that that was her like major role as in the movie. She's actually been doing commercials since she was like nine months old. That was actually her first credit, was nine months old in the commercial. A few other interesting movie info. In 1981, she was in uh, the movie Roar. Her mom, Tippy Hedren, who is also in the movie The Bird. So she was in the movie Roar with her mom. It was directed by her stepdad, Noel Marshall. And in the movie, she was actually attacked. During the filming of the movie, she was actually attacked by a tiger. She had to have 50 stitches to her face. And at one point, and they actually thought she was going to lose an eye. So it's actually pretty crazy. I think I actually read an article about that movie. It's actually pretty crazy. Like actually like living with that tiger for like a few months <laughs> wow if it wasn't for the don johnson connection getting melanie griffith to be in this episode is actually a big get 
Mm-hmm. Like she's a big time actress. She's in a lot of stuff. She had been in obviously since nine months old. And she is also like an Academy Award nominated yep. actress. Like this yeah. was a big get for Miami Vice, regardless of the connection with Don Johnson. Oh, yeah. I mean, right after this, she would do Working Girl with Harrison Ford. She would get an Academy Award nomination and she would actually win a Golden Globe. So, so and then, a- yeah, she was 90- 93's Money with Don Johnson. Uh, she was also in Cecil B. Demented in 2000 and in 97's Lolita, just to name a few. Yeah, she's quite the accomplished actress, regardless of, like I say, with Don Johnson and her past with substance abuse and etc. So it's actually a big deal. And actually, this episode is full of guest stars Mm -hmm. because we talked about our wrestlers we got Mm -hmm. melanie griffith and we're gonna go see our next guest star because we head over to an unnamed boss at this point now we're gonna find out later that his name is togaru but we head over to his place and he is very upset with the goons with uga and booga (laughs) that they were able to kill symington but with instantly going into the scene i mean just instantly hearing that voice i was like oh my god (laughs) <laughs> it is yeah his voice is unrecognized you can recognize him really easily he wants his goons to go he wants uga and buga to go kill the girl like john just said it's george takai so melanie griffith yeah. and oh now <laughs> <laughs> and now george takai and we're not done with guest stars so george takai playing kenneth Tagaru. One of his first things he did in Hollywood was in 1955, he did a voiceover for the Godzilla movie, Godzilla Raids Again. No way. Yeah. So, wow. You know, so, a little inside knowledge that's considered to be like the worst Godzilla ever made, by the way, because <laughs> it's the American, it's the first American one where they redid the original Godzilla, but made it American. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, you might know a little bit more about the Godzilla movie than me. <laughs> he was actually in like a Twilight Zone episode and a few other things before in 1965 he auditioned for the second pilot to play Sulu in Star Trek which he the original Star Trek from 65 to 1969 played uh, Zulu which is you know one of the biggest sci-fi characters ever after the show ended, he would do the animated voice from 73 to 74, and also voicing numerous other aliens on the show. He would do the whole Star Trek convention circuit with the rest of the crew, but he would continue acting. He was appearances in Kung Fu and Six Million Dollar Man. I mean, and, and just continued doing them. I mean, he guest starred on The Simpsons, which is always a pretty big, I mean, you're a pretty big someone. I mean, all the way up to his, as, all the way up, even up to, Appearing on The Celebrity Apprentice. He's still very relevant, very active on Twitter. I follow him on Twitter. That cast of the original Star Trek, when that show ended, they got busy. Leonard Nimoy, George Takai, William Shatner, like, you have have a camera? I'm there. Yeah, let's do this. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you would think, like I said, maybe there's one more guest star and it'll be later in the episode. But you'd be wrong because the very next scene that we go to, the duo finally make it over to the party host's house, who is officially credited as the society dame. That's what they call her, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And they're questioning her about si- Symington's death. She's, I, I mean, I guess she's broken up about it. But she's saying this not... This doesn't happen in our circles. Not a lot of people get murdered. Like, have you not been paying attention to what's happening in Miami? Rich people are getting murdered all the time. They got a whole yeah. division that just handles rich people getting killed. <laughs> She's more upset yeah, that she, they had set her party. That this is a, such a shame on such a beautiful party she was having on her yacht. Oh, I love it. She she was like, yeah, blackmailed all the time, but you know, murder murder is so beneath <laughs> us. I mean, that's so last year. She uh, she also said robbed. She's like, we get robbed all the time, but never murder. Uh-huh. <laughs> By the way, that is, she's played by Veronica Cartwright, who was actually in a ton, a ton of stuff. But the only thing I, that I really want to mention, because I thought it was interesting, was that she was slated to play Ripley in the original Aliens movie. But at the very, very last minute, they swapped her for Sigourney Weaver. And she was in a ton of stuff. Like, it's amazing when you look at her filmography for veronica cartwright like she is in an amazing amount of stuff and i do a quick look up to see who it was when i saw her picture from alien i'm like oh yeah yeah <laughs> in a weird twist she kind of looks like naomi rapace who's in yeah, the new who's in the uh, new one yeah. prometheus ones so it's kind of weird like <laughs> <laughs> while they're talking to the society dame she says she knows Allie, 
So she got a photo shoot at a modeling agency. She got a card for the modeling agency too, because she might go get some pictures taken for her husband. Mm -hmm. For her husband, mm -hmm. booty water, <laughs> booty water. Five hundred dollars first them. hour. <laughs> yeah, five hundred dollars for the first hour. Four hundred and fifty for each additional hour. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she gives the name of the photographer to the duo, and it's listed as Dela Moreno. Now, pals, <laughs> you know exactly where this is going. <laughs> yeah, and Crockett does by the look on his face while reading the card. He's like, "Oh boy!" <laughs> so they head over to Dela Moreno's studio, his boudoir <laughs> photography, wars, yes. as it says on the outside of his place, <laughs> in between the liquor store and the pawn shop. <laughs> they come in. He's in the middle of a photo shoot. She runs off into the bathroom and the duo start talking to none other than Izzy. Who else would it be to be mixed up into this in between stripping and stealing trucks? He's got time to take yes. boudoir photography. Where is his greyhounds? That's all I would like to know. <laughs> Who's taking care of your greyhounds yeah. while you're taking care of these people? <laughs> the more important question, what are we going to do about Tubbs and Crockett defecating on his First Amendment? <laughs> totally yeah. ruining the vibe here. I know all the words he uses are so funny. <laughs> How long has he been on parole? A long time because he keeps screwing he, up. <laughs> he quits, if he quits doing dumb shit, like he can get <laughs> off parole. <laughs> After some back and forth and defecating on his First Amendment, <laughs> they eventually get out of him that he knows who Allie is and her address. He's like, oh, yeah, she lives at blank to blank to blank. Her last name is Allie Ferrero. Well, he later on he gives it out to the bad guys too, the goons. Mm -hmm. Like he's like, Yeah, you want a number uh. here, take it. <laughs> uh. Duo show up over at Allie's, and of course she's gone. So the scene is just they learn she's gone. But what's most important is we head next to Sonny's boat, and Sonny's on the phone calling Christine. He's like, Don't worry about how I got your number. I got my magic ways. Asked mm -hmm. her out on a date. She accuses him of being a gigolo. And that's the most accurate statement I've ever heard of Sonny Crockett ever. <laughs> He's a pretend gigolo. He's not even a real gigolo. <laughs> Who says no to Sonny Crockett? I want to know. Point him out. I want to see what they look like. I want to judge him. <laughs> I don't know. We're getting close to this little date they start having. And at the beginning of the date, I, I thought he was tanking. I thought she was going to be gone by the dessert. <laughs> Well, he did run into the Berlin Wall, you know. So at the end of the day, he says that. <laughs> mm -hmm. He begs. He stands at that door and begs to come like, in. Oh, I guess that's it, huh? Which is something that we're used to with Sonny. Like that's, and we've seen him in this situation many <laughs> times. <laughs> I feel like he should be fanny pack guy because that's what I kind of felt like with the pastel outfit he's wearing. Like, like he's missing a fanny pack. <laughs> After dinner and begging at her door, he eventually goes home. She goes inside, has some thinking time, and out comes Allie crying. Jeez. And she tells Christine they killed Chucky, and she's really scared. And they and they end the scene. And now this will finally be our final guest star that we have to name in this episode. And this is a big one, another big one. Well, before we can do it, why do people ever wear shoulder pads? Look at a linebacker coming out there. Jesus. <laughs> mean Joe Green gonna take gonna uh take Christine's head off. Okay, so Ali is played by Vanity, a Canadian singer, songwriter, model, and actress. She appeared in some commercials for toothpaste, and then where she kind of got her start in modeling. She would pose for Playboy in 1985 and 1988, and actually on a couple album covers, group cameo. And during all of that, basically performing with Prince, Prince pretty much made her a star after the two met and she basically joined prince's band she would actually try and have her own solo career she would star in action jackson and release some solo music on her own ultimately drug addiction would ruin her career it would almost kill her in 1994 and in 97 in 1997 she would need a kidney transplant to become a born again christian after the transplant but eventually in 2016 she would die of kidney failure basically because of the transplant so i love um, action jackson too oh yeah not just because of vanity but also uh, because of carl weathers like, uh carl weathers <laughs> <laughs> and credit to prince because this is the second prince connection that we've had in vice with sheila e and just the power of prince in the 80s oh the power of prince yeah, all through his life yeah. 
<laughs> so after we see Allie confessing to Christine that Chucky has died, we head over to the precinct the next morning, and Tubbs and Crockett are walking in. Crockett's kind of commiserating about how he got stonewalled the night before with Tubbs, and Tubbs drops a truth bomb right at the end. He's like, ha, 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 yeah. So when are you going to tell her you're a cop? And Croc is just like, oh, suck eggs, <sighs> pal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't understand what he what he was going to have with her. Like, <laughs> if he was like all like, oh, we we're going to be serious and I really like her and she's she's really smart. You can talk about these things with her, but I'm not going to tell her I'm a cop. Like, that's going to come up. <laughs> she's going to figure out you're not really hey, a hey, businessman. <laughs> don't burst his bubble. She's going to be his future sugar mama. <laughs> yeah, she's apparently. Talking like, man, she got money. She's paying for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real fast scene because they're just telling dad that they don't have any information and dad doesn't really care about they're this case stumped. too much he's like eh whatever still let me stumped. know what you get <laughs> yeah we have no leads guy fell out of the sky we don't even know why we were watching it <laughs> <laughs> we go back to izzy's and uga and booga show up and grab izzy before he can leave and they start trashing his stuff until he finally caves in and tells him who ali is uh not that much stuff they crash like they just broke like one thing and he's like okay fine here she is this is where she is hey, they pulled some film out of the canister too so it's just you know ruining his work his, how, how he's paying yeah, his bills. Yeah. His work. Give me a break. <laughs> clearly, these two are a tag team. They clearly worked, worked the best together. <laughs> Later, then you see that Uga and Buga have left and the duo are there. And Izzy's asking them, so what kind of reward do I get for telling you that Godzilla and Rodan came by and immortalized me? <laughs> 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 hey, maybe they did some stuff we didn't see, okay? <laughs> and then they finally get some information. Crockett asks Izzy, why were Uga and Booga even here? And he says, well, because Ali's a hooker. And then Crockett loses his shit. And he's like, what do you mean she's a hooker? That would have been information that was really important to me the first time I came and talked to you. And how did they not know? <laughs> I know. I don't know how they didn't know Who did they think she was? Who a did, model. <laughs> they think he was taking to a hotel room after a party in the middle of the night also like, like, that she was a model with izzy being her photographer like there should have been warning flares yeah, right no, there he like, showed them pictures of her where she was like nude right or like yeah whatever like semi-nude because because that lady the dub the whatever the fancy lady see she said like well she took some pretty risque photos but you know are, aren't they vice aren't they supposed to know who the local hookers are <laughs> well, apparently not Crockett because he's sleeping with one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Crockett does what he, the way that he can find out is he just calls Switek and says, tell the ladies to investigate the hooker angle. Is he tells them like what, what agency she works for and everything? He doesn't pass that on to Switek. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, Switek in the, in the van by himself, determined to make his dream of being a magician to come true. <laughs> Hey, the Elvis impersonator didn't work, okay? He's got to do something. He's so lonely. He has no one to talk to. No one to show I his really hope, to. Don't disappoint me, Melissa, but I really hope at the end of this series, we find out that Zwytek left the force and became a famous magician. <laughs> I'm not going to answer anything about the future. <laughs> I'll let you be the judge of it. We have a quick scene at Christine's where Christine is telling Allie, like, hey, you got to go. I want to bang this dude named Burnett. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go. <laughs> so Allie goes and puts on a wig and disguises herself so she can get back into her place because she obviously still thinks Uga and Booga after her. And Yeah, but she's just kind of chipper for someone that's about to get murdered. <laughs> and now we get what is a montage combination I never thought would happen. Which is a sex murder montage. Now, they're not combined. They're separate. There's Sonny Crockett, mm -hmm. sex scene, and then Allie getting murdered in a different location. Now, she's able to... And Allie's to get getting murdered. She's not, she, she's not killing herself because she's having to watch the sex scene. That's actually <laughs> something completely different happening somewhere else. At, at first, I thought that's what it was. was like, oh my god, she's having to watch that and she's cho getting choked out. Like, that's horrible. <laughs> the sex scene with Sunny and Christine is graphic for TV for yeah. net for network, for network TV. TV yeah. yeah, back then for especially so yeah so graphic that it was actually originally two minutes, but the network made them cut it down to a minute and twelve because it was just too steamy. I want to see the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> What's on the cutting room floor? <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's go back to the fact that old Don is directing this with his girlfriend guest starring. And, oh, gee, we're going to spend two minutes on this sex. How many takes do you think they spent on that sex scene? <laughs> I think they spent you, like half the afternoon. Is there a potential that's like that was real sex that made it on the network TV? Maybe. <laughs> and of course, Allie's wig works to sneak past Switek, who's watching at the front of, of her apartment complex. And after she gets murdered, the next day, Castillo is there with the duo talking to Switek, and Dad is very disappointed in Switek. Because she looks exactly the same. Yeah. It's just her hair is different. Come on, Switek. Get your head out of your magician book and do your job. Let's go to the scoreboard, guys. We, now we have it. Goons 2, Surveillance 0. <laughs> Can you even call it surveillance if they don't even watch what they're supposed to be watching? <laughs> what are they surveilling? <laughs> Nothing, because they're not even looking the right direction. <laughs> and how do they miss Lambuga coming in and out? That's exactly what they say. How do they miss it? And, of course, Crockett blames uh, hotel security. He's like, you could land an airplane in this place. With the- <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> and then Sunny finally says, like, hey, maybe we should investigate this escort service that she was attached to. Maybe we should have done that like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> But um, first, he had to have sex with his girlfriend. So. <laughs> yeah, some company He's called so Caprice. Happy too. I thought he, w- I thought he was just going to start whistling. <laughs> <laughs> they go by Caprice, and it's a sex, a uh, phone sex company. And what's great is that all the ladies who are working on the phone sex hotlines dress like their character. What's the girl with the weightlifter supposed to be? <laughs> Very confused. <laughs> we met at the gym. My, ah. first, my, my first thought was like, Cubs, fake an accent so they don't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> they might recognize that, though. That's that Jamaican guy that called in all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quality front desk person too because she's like yeah we do stuff here no you can't talk to my boss no you can't talk to me no i can't look in the computer yeah she did her job. job she knew what she was person. supposed to do <laughs> yeah. it's a legitimate yeah. business we, of course we work with the police it's a legitimate <laughs> business but we don't do we can't look in our yeah. computer so sorry that can't happen and for crocodile and tubs it's like wow this has been very productive you know uh, we found <laughs> out absolutely zero <laughs> and when they showed up and saw where the Caprice offices were, Sonny's like, hey, my girlfriend's office is on the same floor. What a coincidence. <laughs> Let's go see Christine. <laughs> and they go in and Sonny says the worst date ever after he finds out that Christine's been nominated for the Chamber of Commerce's business person of the year it's like hey, let's go back to my place and watch it while and eat pizza and drink champagne. Like sounds like the worst combination yeah. ever. <laughs> Oh, my God. And on a <laughs> boat? All that rocking? The bubbles in your stomach with all grease? Oh. On a boat in a waterbed. <laughs> in a waterbed, yes. <laughs> At Christine's, after that amazing mix of pizza and cheap champagne, they start sharing secrets. And she just says, hey, make sure you watch me for the bit Businesswoman of the Year interview on one of the local news stations tomorrow. Good so at morning, the- Miami. <laughs> <laughs> at the precinct the next day, Sunny is watching the show. And we also see for a brief second that Togaru is watching it, too. Just as like a flash reminder, he's still in this episode. <laughs> he's just, still there. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't forget about him. <laughs> this reporter came prepared. Mad respects this reporter making the vice team look so bad. He's like, hey, congratulations. Uh-huh. Your dad's a millionaire by selling weapons in Germany. That's cool, I guess. Yeah, well, that was a weird one. <laughs> by the way, by the way <laughs> Klaus von Mar- Marbid is it, it, a fake name. Totally fake. <laughs> throw that out there trudy tries to come in and talk to him before we get down to the meat on this bone the reporter then says hey we also did some investigation into you we found out that you are the owner of the caprice escort service so you also make a lot of money being a madam what do you have to say about that and the camera zooms in on sunny's face like oh my god we're like yeah and trudy's right next to him going yeah i've been trying to tell you that but you Uh wouldn't let me (laughs) now let's check the scoreboard news one vice zero (laughs) yep (laughs) come on guys let's do do a little police work 
We've got a couple <laughs> dead bodies at this point. <laughs> Trudy lays it all out. Christina tried to hide it and tried to bury it through a bunch of different companies. Castillo comes in. She's like, hey, by the way, someone needs to go pick up Christine. Ladies. Yeah, he doesn't know anything about what's going on. Dad's mm-hmm. that in the dark about oh, and, him boning and, down with the, the <laughs> madam. <laughs> That, that is when, based on the look on Sonny's face, that is what I wrote down. Like, Sonny's got this look on his face that's like, no one tell dad. <laughs> <laughs> no one tell him I am boning this. <laughs> so I'm going to put a bunch of stuff together here. Crockett asks Tubbs to get the phone records to see if Christina's calls si- Symington. Downstairs, he goes and talks to a tech who discovers that Togaru, Symington, and Christine were all partners in a business venture. And Tubbs also says that he saw that she had been calling Symington. And so they decided to bring in Christine for questioning. And in this gigantic interrogation room, they are alone, Sonny and Christine. And they come clean with like that neither of them knew that each other was like, say, a cop or a madam or whatever they were involved in. And Mm -hmm. that he gets out of her without her actually saying it, that Symington was skimming. Togaru and Christine are business partners and close friends, and so they decided to get rid of Symington. And then Sonny's like, well, guess what? You're wearing a wire and setting up this deal between okay. Cooper and Burnett. If we break down the things that just happened here, one, why did they not pull the uh, phone records and investigate the dead guy when he fell off the balcony? Yeah, because they would have like, been why are they just ch- that I was calling Christine's oh, phone. He's been ca- yeah. Huh, why is this guy calling my girlfriend? <laughs> the second thing is, is who's, who's the bigger lie right now? The madam who it, who just didn't tell him that she was a madam, but at least told him her real name? Or the undercover cop who gave her a fake name and basically everything she knows about him is fake? Who's telling the bigger lie there? Yeah, Melissa. Because this is something that caught your attention while we were watching this. Yeah, I said that he can't act like he's high and mighty in this situation. He lied about everything. At least she told him her name. He had no reason to lie to her if he didn't know she was in the investigation. Why didn't he tell her the truth? What was he going to do? When? At what point was he going to tell her the truth? (laughs) Like, hey, I'm an undercover policeman and Tubbs is not really a Jamaican businessman. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Shocking. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i mean yeah he doesn't, so, he doesn't even um, tell her his real name and then he acts like he's so high and mighty like well you know sorry i had to lie to you and she's like this was all a setup he's like no it wasn't a setup which i had no idea i was just lying to you and boning you <laughs> <laughs> and then on a side note she does point out that she wasn't actually a whore but she just sold whores well yeah she's saying she Clarifying. never actually did the that part she just actually sold it but that she has a connection to george takai i can not remember his name right now to Carl, whatever. To that Carl she has a connection that yeah. they are close. Mm-hmm. They are acquaintances. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this, this all leads us to the dumbest plan. <laughs> We're going to tell Sulu that, that, that you're in a pain and you need to get out of town. So, here, hold on. Let, 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 let me see if I can break this down. If Sulu does business with Burnett and Cooper, they'll pay Christine. And then Christine can use the link to leave Miami. That's how she's going to convince him <laughs> oh, to she do does business more. with us. That then she'll get a cut. I don't see why Su- Sulu couldn't just give give Christine money. And she does more than just convince him to meet with Cooper and Burnett, which we see in the next scene where the bug is in her purse. And he she explains the, the plan. And he's like... Yeah, you're going to have to do more than that. Yeah, we, I just don't do it just for friends. Mm-hmm. Let's get this. So basically, Crockett turned her into a hooker. She had no choice because yes. how, how was she going to get out of being in trouble? That was how she was going to clear herself was, was wearing a wire and getting him to do what he needed to do. So he turned her into a hooker because she had no choice but to go along with it at that point. And not only that, but then he had to listen to her be a hooker. because <laughs> Just sit there listening on the wire. It's just, oh my, over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> By the way, if you're keeping score, that is surveillance still zero, bad guy (laughs) three. Yeah. I'm giving the point to Takai. So now we're going to do what Vice did on this episode. Like, oh, shit, we got to hurry up and patch up this criminal aspect of this episode. And we're going to rush this real fast scene at the end here where they kill Tagaru. They set up the sting. The duo are there with Jamaican Cooper, by the way. The best Cooper. <laughs> yes. They're setting up the deal. They want 15% to launder the money. Tagaru's like, hey, that's cool. But 
our mutual friend neglected to tell me that she was so in love with the law. And then Uga and Booga and another gunman come out as Tagaro leaves the room. Sonny jumps up and just slams Christine to the ground. Yeah, he just pushes her down. Like, I mean, I know he was trying to save her, but I think he knocked her out. Shootout starts. Uga and Booga get killed by Cooper and Burnett. And then Christine shoots and kills the other gunman. I'm sorry. Sh- Christine shoots and kills Tagaru, mm-hmm. saving Sunny's life. Yep. And killing her money train. <laughs> he was who was paying for everything. Yep. And now we head to the last scene of the episode. Sunny is on his boat. He's out fishing. Christine shows up and she says that she's leaving the country. She's done with Miami. She's done with the U.S. She has opportunity with a client. And she's just there to say goodbye. And we get classic brooding Sunny. And a freeze frame at the end of the episode because he had mentioned earlier, first a junkie and now a hooker. Now he has no, uh, what did he basically say? That he, maybe he needs to take a break or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mm-hmm. would suggest not looking up women in the yep. evidence locker. <laughs> Stop meeting women at work, okay? <laughs> Meet them somewhere else. Well, at least the, the junkie doctor yeah, knew he was a policeman. <laughs> so let's go talk about this week's music. This was a star-studded episode and looking at the music it looks pretty strong so let's go talk about this week's music all right john i glanced at this week's music it's some people that we've heard from before and someone of course i have no idea who they are what do you got for us this week we are gonna start with steve winwood split decision and simply reds holding back the years now both of these people have appeared in the music previous to this and i think at least one of them is gonna appear moving forward into the future i know i have talked about them and rather than have to go back and figure out what i said the last time i'm just gonna sum them both up really quickly just to make sure we cover all of our bases in the future if they pop up again we, we will know we have we will start with Steve Winwood, most notably known for the groups, the Spencer Davis group, the band Traffic, Find Faith, and uh, the band Go. Uh, he also had a successful solo career, pretty much with Winwood. He was part of Birmingham, uh, the Birmingham rhythm and blues scene, and basically, in about the mid-60s, basically, the blues, American blues, became really popular in Britain and in England, basically. And time in America, a lot of legendary blues artists like Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker and B.B. King, they were making very much money touring in America. But England, because it suddenly became popular, what they found was that they would pay them four to five times as much. So a lot of blues musicians in the 60s traveled to England and basically toured around and, and just hung around it. During this time, Steve Wood was pretty much a session museum as uh, it was custom for the big name artists to travel solo and then just hire session musicians wherever they played at. Because of this, Winwood played with Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, B.B. King, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. Uh, as a session musician, he actually joined the Spencer Davis group when he was 14 years old with his bro with his brother Muff. Uh, it, that's really his name, Muff. <laughs> <laughs> As soon as he started making money with the Spencer Davis group, he bought an organ and started jamming with Eric Clapton. He would actually jam with Clapton, but ultimately, uh, and with Eric, as part of Eric Clapton and Powerhouse, but ultimately only three tracks would make that comp- compilation. But he also co-wrote the song Give Me Some Love and on that. So he would leave the Spencer Davis group. He would join Traffic, which would be the band he would be uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with. But he would also try and spawn off some of these super groups. Like in 69, he had the super group Blind Faith, once again, collaborating with Eric Clapton. And that would last a whopping one tour before Clapton would go on to do other things. Winwood's first solo stuff would start around... 1977, uh, he would peak in the 80s and pretty much 90s, 2000s and beyond, just reunite with bands like Traffic and work with those guys. And but just legendary guitar who just kind of existed in that, uh, in that just from the 60s in that crazy scene. So then we jump to Simply Red, who was a British pop group formed in 85. Really, the song Hold. Hold Back the Years featured in this episode reached the top 10 UK charts and actually reached number one 
it, uh, on the U.S. Billboard uh, Hot 100. It would ultimately have five number one albums in the U.K. Year to date, they've actually sold over 50 million records. Yeah, and they are huge. When I, yeah, yeah. And w- when I do my music, a lot of times I'll learn what the early incarnation band is called, what the band was for the band. And they have one of my favorite names. The band was originally called Frantic Elevators. <laughs> <laughs> it, it lasted seven years it was mostly local fame but at the very end of frantic elevators they would come up with the with a critically hit acclaimed hit song in back the years which they would then re-record as simply red and that would be their first hit and then simply red would go on from there from basically from 9 95 just drop and hit and, i mean they would just continue drop hits until eventually in in the early 90s they would start to lose member members first their guitarist would leave and then sometime around 1991 the lead singer mick hucknell would announce that the band is basically just a solo act basically saying the band's g you know and a bunch of session artists at that point a few other band members including the brass section would leave they would continue to release songs and make it on on uh, stay on the charts, at least the UK charts, until eventually in 96, it was just Hucknall, pretty much what he wished for, a bunch of session artists. He was the only member left in the band. Even though they were still so successful, the whole band had quit. It was it's just, you know, the Mick Hucknall show at that point. 2003 to 2010, they would continue touring, but in 2008, Hucknall would release his first solo album and announce that they were going to retire after a farewell tour. After a hiatus from 2010 to 2015, they would show back, they would get back together and tour with some of the original band members and even release an album. Now that we've touched back on those two, let's talk 30,000 Feet of Broken Homes. They are a club band formed by Mike Doman, and they basically were one of LA's biggest club bands in 1986. And so they got signed to a record deal. They released three albums from 86 to 1990. That would be their self-titled Bones album, which would feature this song. That would be featured on Vice. Their 1988 uh, album, uh, Straight Line Through Time. And then their 1990 Wing and a Prayer album, which would feature the song, I'm All Right, parentheses, Get a Doctor, uh, which would be featured in the movie Another 48 Hours. Not a whole lot on this ending there. I mean, other than having a song in the movie and a song in the TV show, weren't really that famous. Well, I did some extra digging, and Bro- Broken Homes guitarist Craig Ross, Broken Homes, while in high school, Broken Homes would open for bands like Stevie Ray Vaughan, In Excess, and Jerry Lee Lewis during their time popular in LA. Damn. And they would also be, and the, during that time, they're, they were doing club gigs with bands like Guns N' Roses and Jane's Addiction. Damn. You guys still there? Yeah. Which is a pretty big deal. I mean, considering Guns N' Roses and Jane's Addiction went on to be huge bands. Rather than Broken Homes go on to be a big band, Craig Ross would actually have a chance meeting in an L.A. pool hall with Lenny Kravitz, which was facilitated, strange enough, by Kathy Valentine of the Go-Go's. Oh, weird. And the next 13 years, he would co-write and perform with Lenny Kravitz, including co-writing the hit, which, which basically helped propel Lenny Kravitz' career, Are You Going My, uh, Gonna Go My Way? Craig Ross, this, the person who formed the band Broken Homes, would go on to basically be the guitarist for Lenny Kravitz and co-write like half of his music. That took a turn I was oh. not prepared for. He would work with other artists as well, including Sheryl Crow, the Black Crows, and guess what? Eric Clapton. <laughs> he is currently producing projects for Rocky Records as he's trying to get into record producing now. But yeah, so Broken Homes really never made it big, but their guitarist did. Pretty much helped break Lenny Kravitz's career out. That was a name I did not expect to make an appearance in this music segment. <laughs> <laughs> or any music yes. segment, really. Well, let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. I have a feeling it's going to take a little bit of a turn like the music segment did. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. All right, guys, I'm going to kick off this week when it comes to my final thoughts. 
You know, this was a, and we talked about this before we started recording. This was a middle of the road Miami Vice episode. This is the exact kind of episode I would expect with only four episodes left to go in the season. They're going to be a couple middle of the road ones set up for a couple big ones at the end of the season. Now, I'm to understand that I shouldn't get my hopes up too high with how the season ends. Not like, you know, say Evan ending season one. But, you know, it's just this is what I would expect at this point in the season. They're getting ready to close this thing out. They saved some real big ones for the end of the season. So it was okay. You know, it was the normal Vice stuff. It was really racy for being network TV. And it makes sense that it was Melanie Griffith and Don Johnson behind the camera on this episode so i understand where that came from it was still pretty risque behind the camera between the sheets (laughs) (laughs) i have this feeling like this was a classic vice episode though like what we are used to from season one and two chock full of music a whole bunch of huge guest stars and an episode directed by don johnson this just had all the markings of a what miami vice is known for this isn't an exceptional episode it isn't a bad episode it was a normal week of miami vice i guess is what i would say melissa what are your final thoughts on this episode i like this episode for many reasons um i like the fact that even though Crockett doesn't do his job <laughs> correctly. <laughs> I like when they show when he's like, he has that like goofy soft side where he is being vulnerable and he's like, he really likes her and he's talking to Tubbs about how much he likes her. And it's cute. I think it's cute that it shows he's actually supposed to be human, that he's not just a robot that does his job and all he cares about is, you know, his job. He has a soft side and he actually, it's, once again, it shows that he wants to have a girlfriend so bad that he's willing to overlook <laughs> and not investigate them at all, apparently. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, I wish that none of those people had to die before he realized that she was a hooker. <laughs> and that maybe Zwitek could lay off the magic and he did his job for, you know, he could stop doing <laughs> magic in the van. He would notice that that was her. But but no, I like it. I mean, it's you know, like, like you said, it's the middle of the road. It's not great it's not bad it was very sexy sexy time going on there they had some obviously we had izzy i can't complain when we have an izzy spotlight and that's one of my favorite ones is when he's the he's like the (laughs) photographer (laughs) the models wearing that neck brace for no reason so yeah european style i'm not going to complain about don johnson sex scene sorry (laughs) there was no feet rubbing thank god John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I think it's another episode that is hammering home the fact that Don Johnson, or I should say Sonny Crockett, makes terrible decisions, especially when it comes to women. (laughs) If we just look at the women, we have criminal, druggie, and now pimp. (laughs) <laughs> uh, as far as uh, women he's dated, had no idea she was a pimp until the news told him. Which <laughs> also pretty impressive that you have to learn about it on the news. <laughs> <laughs> Can I find sources all over the place, John? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and we are not that far removed from Sonny helping a murderer get out of prison. Let's True. not forget about yeah, that. That's a big one. I will give you that. I can overlook the whole like, well, you know, there was the junkie, and yeah, okay, so he was thinking with his heart and everything, but he let a murderer out of jail. But you know what? Don't worry, they'll yes. come back around. <laughs> okay, all of that and all of that aside, the loser in this episode is Ali. Ali, Christine doesn't give a shit about she just lets her go you know just like hey get out of here i'm trying to bone my man and just sends her packing no one if, if anyone had done any police work or had even attempted to help ally she wouldn't be dead but because no one gave a crap about ally she ends up getting strangled by uga and booga she's the one i feel sorry for uh, yeah she definitely got this. the raw end so. of the stick on this one <laughs> yeah. yeah and you're right you she know, doesn't feel uh, sad about uh, it <laughs> she doesn't even act like she cares <laughs> No, no one cares about poor Ellie. She's just some poor hooker. It's another episode that hammers home the fact that Sonny Burnett makes poor decisions. Like you said, it's quintessential vice fashion. Yeah, and if only there was some way in the future Sonny Crockett would start to have a better understanding on who Sonny Burnett is. Oh, wait. <laughs> There's a huge story arc <laughs> of that coming, too. <laughs> he needs to get back in touch with his meat fondler uh, uh, e- episode, Burnett. Like, that's the detective we want. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love, love, love 
to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at go with the heat. You want to find other ways to contact us? Check out the website, go with the heat.com. Click on about us. You can find all the ways to talk to me, Melissa, or John, talk to the show. You can click on subscribe. You can find all the places that you can find this show. YouTube, tune in, iTunes, Google Play, a link directly for Pocket Cast, my preferred podcatcher of choice. You tap on that, takes you right into the app, and adds the show right to your podcatcher. Be sure to check out that website. You can find all the show notes as well, all the links for the music. You can find everything you need to know about this episode on Miami Vice. That is going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.